our next speaker is bound to receive a much more plentiful applause than that. Um, he's VP Experience Design at McKinsey and & Company, and he's here to talk about how established companies can act a little more like more dynamic digital startups. We're very, very glad to have him here, and uh, we're sure to welcome him with an applause that not only exponentially, but double exponentially beats the one we just heard. Please give it up for Kwame Ingenning. Hello, my name is Kwame Ingenning, and I am VP of Experience Design for McKinsey and & Company. And Hands in the air of folks that know who McKinsey is, heard of him before. All right, that's cool, good. So McKinsey is a management consulting firm. And uh, it was started by this guy, James O. McKinsey, uh, almost about 100 years ago to serve large corporations who were needing uh, counsel around the running of their business. And over the past few hundred, a uh, few, few decades, uh, McKinsey has wound up representing maybe, I think it's like 40% of the Fortune 500, 60% of the CEOs in the Fortune 500 have passed through McKinsey, and the bulk of the work has primarily been around uh, sort of like big business types of stuff. And uh, yeah, and so I joined McKinsey about maybe a year and a half ago, and I come from the design agency world. So I worked at Frog Design, I worked at Sapient, I worked at these really big global design firms and uh, have primarily been focused on customer experience, experience design, user experience, UI, physical product, digital product, all that kind of stuff. So the question is, uh, oftentimes that I get is, why, why did you join McKinsey? And uh, my clicker's not working. Uh, and the reason I joined McKinsey was because I saw the potential of being in a place that had access to some of the world's leading products and services uh, and merging that with technology and, and design. So uh, what, there we go. So this is the question, is why does, McK is why does James O. McKinsey give a fuck about design. Why, like, it's, it's, it seems completely kind of non-intuitive that these consultants that come in with slide decks with all these sort of numbers and charts and graphs and are talking about, thank you, and are talking about sort of corporate transformation or optimization, why bring in designers? And I think we need to begin thinking about, well, just like, what is design? What is, what's, what, what's the activity that, that, uh, that or, the, or the, the purpose that design serves? And, you know, we work with clients all over the world. We do a lot of workshopping and prototyping and all that kind of stuff. And, and oftentimes we're in the mix. And even, even I, I forget about, like, what it is that we're really doing. And what it's really about, at least at its, at its core, design is initially about craft, right? The first designers, weren't even, they didn't call themselves designers. They were just people that made stuff and they tried to make it in the best way that they could possibly make it. And then design sort of moved into being sort of about industry. This is a patent application for the paperclip, which is probably one of the best design products ever, you know, uh, as far as the simplicity and its utility and its ubiquitousness. Uh, but it was primarily something that came about because of uh, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, the ability to sort of mass manufacture things, and it was about designing things to fit into uh, an industrial context. And then we kind of evolved and design came, became about brand. It became about communicating a set of characteristics and attitude, uh, a certain sense of quality and, uh, and taste. Uh, and you know, Braun, this, this could be an, an, an Apple uh, product, uh, but it was produced, I don't know, maybe 40, 40 years ago by, by Dieter Rahm. And then we realize that you know, design is about experience, where it's much more about the ease of use and sort of the utility and it all coming together and how it makes you feel. 
But again, you know, so why does James O. McKenzie give a fuck about design, right? None of this really seems relevant to business. But primarily because now we're entering a stage in which design is business, in which the products and services that we are designing are uh, much more closely linked to the day-to-day -day running of the, of the enterprise. And it's hard. Apple's just released this thing. And who knows if it's going to work. There's going to be like a, a lot of money dumped into this. And, in, and people are going to put it into their homes. And there's going to be all kinds of ecosystem dependencies. And there's going to be all kinds of complexity that's introduced by introducing this one product that has a physical component, a digital component, natural UI, co commercial utility, all of it. Design is difficult. So what we've seen happening at McKinsey is that a lot of our clients are developing customer experience capabilities. And those customer experience capabilities are really looking at sort of the overall value chain and all the different touch points within an ecosystem. And they have UX teams, and maybe some of you guys in here are UX designers or UI designers working in-house at, at large corporations. And they've developed those muscles and are beginning to actually put stuff out into the market that's considered and reflects a design sensibility, or at least an understanding that people want to use beautifully made things. And a large part of that is because we've realized that it's all about a journey, right? So we did some work with IKEA uh, last year where we went in and looked at what was the in-store journey and how could we improve it. So first we had to go, go do the research and talk to people and understand IKEA's uh, business context and their priority. And then we looked at all the pain points and the emotional state that somebody might have moving through the, through, through the, through the store environment, both sort of prior to sort of when they're doing their research as well as after when, when they've already bought it. And we realized that there's these tension points, these butt moments. And that's where a lot of the business viability is. That's where a lot of the opportunity is. And so I've come up with this term that I call dollar X, right? It's the CX, the customer experience, the UX. But there has to be an element of dollar X. There has to be an element in which there's a recognition that transactional volume and complexity is now impacting design in a way that it never has. And it's also impacting the organizations that are putting these products out in a way that it never has. So you look at WeChat Pay, which is in China, and uh, it's insane the amount of transactions that they have uh, on a year on a year by year basis, and the amount of money half a trillion half a trillion dollars has passed through uh, their their wallet, and they're not even first in in market share. Alipay is first, and we can look to China as sort of in many ways the future. There's a lot of what's going on out there is, is shaping what's going to be happening in Europe and, and in the West. And so when we think about these massive ecosystems that are so interdependent and so close to the close so closely closely tied to business priority, we begin to think about the role that design might play in this idea of dollar X and the impact that dollar X is going to have, not just on the product development and product design aspect of the business, but the entire business. All the way from the ways in which strategy is set, in which analytics are structured, and business operations are, are organized, from an architecture, from a tech stack and partnership standpoint, and from a DevOps standpoint as well. All of these things are merging on this idea of dollar $X. And if you think about it, there's a simple formula, which is customer experience, plus transactional volume equals dollar X. And that's where we're going to focus. That's where McKinsey is focusing on understanding how people use things, what their pain points are, the th all the things that kind of make something desirable. But we also have to think about business viability and technical viability and feasibility. So for me personally, I'm super excited about open banking. This is one of the things that's like got me uh, keeps me up at night, just my, my brain churning. And open banking is all about banks opening up their APIs to people and, and allowing uh, an individual to get a view into their account balance or in, uh, across all of their different accounts, credit cards, multiple savings accounts, checks accounts, and different institutions uh, in an in in easy and, and seamless way. And they're also opening this up to businesses. Another thing is PSD2. 
which is all about payments, seamless payments, the ability to pay uh, for something using your bank account without having to go through a credit card processing uh, gateway or anything like that. So much more frictionless payments. Uh, so you know those little Amazon uh, buttons that you have on your on your on your counter that you can just press, and it immediately pays something. Sort of with that one-click buying, that's going to be ubiquitous now for anything and and everything, um, starting in January 2018. So, whoops, that's why that's why James McKenzie gives a fuck about design because it's impacting business. So real quick, I want to talk about sort of some of the principles of, of, of Dollar X. Uh, and it's all about, at the beginning, about the Amish people. I'm, I'm from America, and we have these people in America that are called the Amish. And they started out uh, at, at the, sort of around the 19th century. And they really haven't changed over time. They pretty much wear the same clothes. They don't use electricity. They don't use phones. They drive around on horses and buggies. And their culture is pretty much static. Pennsylvania and uh, parts of parts of, uh, of New Jersey. And for the Amish people, whenever they need a barn built, because they need barns for their cows and their, their supplies and stuff, or you know somebody's barn is burnt down or somebody got married and got in inherited some land and they need a barn, the entire community comes together to, to, make, to make a barn in a day. And a barn is relatively complex. It's not, it's not an easy thing to do, to just show up with some tools and some wood and make a barn. But they're able to do it because they have a shared culture, they have a shared language, and a shared value set. And there are certain patterns that they've been able to uh, glean over the years that allow them to quickly assemble and make a barn. And at McKinsey, we're not really making barns. We're making sort of really complex new, new things. Uh, but we still need these, 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 these languages, we, these pattern languages, these, this sort of awareness of how things need to come together in a very intuitive way that is shared amongst the group that is making the thing. Because if we're doing it right, we wind up making things that can be pretty interesting uh, and new. So one of the things that we do is we work with our clients to develop these pattern languages. And we do it across a bunch of different frameworks. But pretty much it involves being in a workshop, understanding what the problem is, sketching out and defining the ecosystem, and then moving forward to, uh, to, 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 def to define those sort of hero moments within, uh, within a specific journey that we can then place into a service blueprint. So this service blueprint is the thing that captures our pattern language for the business. And it looks at all the different touch points. It looks at all the different sort of physical, digital, social, human interaction moments. It distills them not just at the initial customer touch point, but all of the uh, individual kind of supporting services that have to exist for that touch point to be effective and active in, in somebody's life. And so when we talk about sort of in that journey, awareness for the, for the, for the team that has created that blueprint, we don't talk about awareness, we talk about shifting. And what shifting means is specific to the solution that we're developing. So we're shifting somebody onto the platform in a very subtle way. And that has in and of itself layers and layers of other meaning and other patterns that sit, that, that sit below that. When we talk about welcoming, we say gifting. And again, that has lots of different meanings as opposed to sort of a generic welcome. And the more that you do this, the better able you are to distinguish your product or your service from the competition. Because you're developing a unique and specific language for how your product is going to engage and interact with, with the customer. So we talk about using, it's affirming. And at the end of the day, you know, we talk about continuing, which equals, in this context, saving. So for this product, it was all about saving time. This product this was, it was, was geared at the mass affluent and their time crunched. And so they need to be able to easily understand their options around saving their time. And we wanted to keep in mind that this idea of time was not about saving time so I could spend more time on my phone or spend more time working or spend more time shopping. 
it's about spending and it's about saving that time so that you can do things that are that are that are key and crucial to you in your life. So, first principle is to develop pattern languages. They're very powerful, and they will shift and shape the ways in which you're able to sync and sync the design output and the service output into the business priority. Most of our clients look like this: big, old, rusty, crusty industry, right? But a lot of them want to be this. And in order to go from that big, rusty, crusty state to a cute, compact, sleek, fully integrated, solid state, you need to understand the value at stake. And this is a key point of Dollar X, is being able to look at a business, look at an industry, look at a, a specific product category, break it down, and assign value to it at each, each one of those steps. This one is about banking. So this is broken down into retail banking and corporate banking, all the different products across retail banking and corporate banking, and the different sort of trajectories that each one of those areas is on, uh, say, for cash loans, right, or for insurance or for, 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 uh, for mortgages. And this allows us to identify and understand where are the opportunity areas. And to be very honest, there's probably not another design firm in the world that would be able to do this other than a design firm that's based at McKinsey. And this is the value that we bring. We bring not just, we can paint you a pretty picture, we can present you with a, a very usable and delightful experience, but we're going to be able to look into the heart and the core of your business and distill where the value sits and point you in the right direction. And then once we're able to do that, we can get the suits excited. The guys in the ties are like, oh, okay, you get where we're coming from. We're not just talking to a bunch of fluffy designers. We're talking to people who really get and understand our business. And, and because of that, we're willing to take some risk that we might not necessarily have taken with anybody else or even exposed uh, our other design partners to. So know the value at stake. That's the third one, second one. I, do, I travel a lot to South Africa and I work with banks as you can probably tell, I'm like banks. So I work with banks in South Africa, and we did a review of different bank apps in the South African market for our client. This is not our client. Uh, our client actually scored like w like horribly, but this was the one one of the one of the leaders because of its uh, awesome customer journey. The content strategy was really good. The information architecture was good. The, the interaction model was 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 fantastic. It was part of a a broad suite of, of, of sort of multi-platform, uh, omni-channel uh, device architecture, right? And then this was another one, Capitec. And this one scored 1.9, well below from a UX standpoint, looking at this as far as like a well-designed thing. Its color palette is awful. Its content strategy is horrible. Its interaction model is, is, is dated and outmoded. But the thing is, is that Capitec has 86% more adoption rate and usage rate than any other bank app in the market. And the reason that is, is because when you go into a branch, you don't just get to talk to a, 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 a teller and say, I want to change my address. They tell you to use the app to change your address. They tell you to, if you want to move money, you come, you, you, when you go into the branch, they don't tell you to, to sort of fill out a slip. They say, use your app to move your money. So everything that, that you would want to do, either at a branch or through a call center, flows through the app. So even though the other standard bank had a much better designed app, Capitec, with a horribly designed app, is driving more value, more adoption, and more sort of proliferation, the radiating uh, their value to, the, to, their, to their customers by forcing the ecosystem. So that's three, force the ecosystem. So that's it. That's dollar X. I think it's kind of, you know, going to be something to think about in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kwame. And I'm sure people are eager to get in a couple of questions in a short Q&A, if that's all right. So our mic runners are busily spreading out across the room. Or not. 
where the mic runners are. But where are the hands? Where are the hands? Well, the hands don't seem to be forthcoming. Guess it takes a bit for Dollar X to sink in and it's a big idea. It's a big idea. Give people time and yeah, man. I'm sure you'll also be around if be questions around. pop up later. Yes. Thanks again and a big hand to Kwame Jennings. Thank you.